my glory. Thank you. All right, you can be seated. I know what you're thinking. How can you be in the ministry 48 years when you look 28? Good living. And it's true, 28 plus 40. Hallelujah. Kathy and I are so privileged to be here. My, my wife, Kathy, we married 45 years this June. She gets younger looking every year. I get older looking. I don't know what's happened, but I'm glad. This is, this is, though we're absent in body, we still consider this our home church. We still give here, um, as well as the great Bethel Church. We got two home churches, and uh, some of you know Pastor James Lowe. I serve him as an elder and board member there, Kathy and I, so it's just a great privilege to be here and love Pastor Reggie and Bomi. How many of you are so thankful for our worship team? Oh my goodness. I'm so blessed with Pastor Ponin too. When I heard God was sending her this way, I shouted when Pastor Reggie told me. And um, she's just anointed of God, but not just to lead worship, to equip others to lead. Well, hold on here. Let me do my big technological marvel and open my iPad. <laughs> Holy Spirit, we're so grateful. Jesus, thank you for dying for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son. Holy Spirit, thank you for keeping us connected to the Godhead. Thank you, Lord, for letting your presence rest here. Amen. There's many ways you can preach. We honor the written word of God in this house. It is our final authority, judges everything we do. How many of you are thankful for the Bible? A lot of ways you could preach. I could preach to expositorily this morning, which is verse by verse. I could preach to you topically. Those are great. I'll preach to you prophetically today. I mean, the Holy Spirit has put this specific word on my heart for this church. Um, I'm going to entitle it Power Plant. Embracing the call of God, or your call to be light to the nations. Of course, that's biblical. Isaiah 61 through 3 in the Old Testament says, Arise and shine, your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Look around. Darkness covers the earth. Thick darkness covers the people. But the Lord will rise upon you. And his glory will be seen upon you. And the nations shall come to your light. Kings, to the brightness of your coming. Of course, I've known Pastor Reggie and Bomi since they were college students. That's a long time ago. And Pastor Ron and I have had the joy of pastoring them and mentoring them. They're so dynamic along with Kathy and Lynette. It's taken four of us to do that. It must have been 10 or 11 years ago, if Pastor Eric was here, he might remember that I walked into the door of King's Park. It might have been the front door and come around, I can't remember. As I walked in, right here where our great elders were sitting, Reggie and Bomi were sitting. I'd never seen them sitting on the front row of the church before. And Reggie later told me, the Lord spoke to them that Sunday, sit on the front. I walked in and saw him. And the Holy Spirit, we know he speaks, spoke to me, said, you're looking at the couple that will be integral to leading this church into the future. I knew then. They're going to pastor this church. And the next thing I knew, in an impression of the Holy Spirit, I saw this auditorium like filled with the presence of God. It was filled with people. He said, you'll see when they're leading this church, a revival by my spirit will come.
I was in worship today. How many of you know the Holy Spirit can give you impressions? Raise your hand. You see things, you feel things, you hear things, and that's not our final authority. God's word is. But the Holy Spirit definitely can speak. I was in worship during the first service. There was a sweet, sweet spirit here. Next thing I knew, it was as if the Lord was getting ready to pour out a, just a massive bowl of the water of his Holy Spirit in the presence of God in this place. The Lord said, you watch what I do here. I'm coming. On February 14th, Valentine's Day, I was on the phone with Pastor Reggie and Bomi talking to them about the church. They're so dear to Kathy and I. They're really like blood family with us. And the next thing I knew, I, I saw Kings Park. And it was like filled with water. I laughingly teased Eric Seifert, who stewards all of our finances here in an incredible way. Eric, we're not going to get flooded and need new carpet. Don't be afraid. It was the waters of the presence of God. And I'll go into the Bible in a moment. And it, and it it got so full with the presence of God, I saw these giant turbines begin to spin. If you're here with hydroelectric power, you'll see a, a picture up here in a moment. And in reality, churches are a lot of things, but they're also reservoirs to contain the spirit and power and presence of God. Not just this one, churches all around the city and across the country. And the deeper the water gets in a reservoir, the more power and force it comes out when it's released. And many great reservoirs provide power, drinking water, lots of things through what they call control gates. And underneath the water, there are control gates. And when it gets really, really deep, the water comes out with massive power and can turn turbines and light hundreds and thousands of homes. And he says, Jim, I'm going to fill this church so much with my presence that they produce power. And I saw light begin to pour out of King's Park that you didn't have to drive up to see. It could be seen for hundreds of miles. Now, what's that mean? Why do I believe that? I felt it so strongly that Reggie had me Zoom with our great King's Park team. What does it mean? What am I talking about? Let me describe where we are. No matter where you live or what you're coming out of and where you are in your walk with God, you're currently living in an unusual season in the world. How many of you know the last 20-something years haven't been easy? Starting with 9-11, the worst recession since the Great Depression, the worst pandemic since the Spanish flu, now the worst major war in Europe since World War II. People are afraid. But in the middle of it all, and none of those things, by the way, took God by surprise. That's another message. But hear me. With any meant for evil, God's meant for good. And the earth is ripe for an outpouring of the Spirit. And it's a consensus of many great leaders around the world that God's answered that prayer. And we're in the beginning stages of an outpouring of the Spirit. Kathy and I will be in England um, next weekend meeting with leaders from across England talking about this. Why do I believe that? And what am I talking about? Let me explain this to you. We know God's transcendent. That means he's beyond his creation. He's amazing. But he's also imminent, near us. Through Christ, he's brought us near. It's true. But in Acts chapter 2, he promises times of refreshing until he comes. And in those times, the presence and power of God is poured out so unusually that the church is revived and lost men and women are so impacted by Christ that the darkness that tries to blind them is penetrated and they're drawn. Many great nations of the earth have had these from 
Nigeria to currently Iraq to China to South Korea. I could go on and on. But here in the United States, at every critical juncture in our history, we've had one of these moments. 1730s, every colony was shaken by the power of the Holy Spirit before the Revolutionary War. Thousands of people saved. Before the Civil War, when God was coming to judge the sin of slavery, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that began in the 1820s. Thousands, thousands. Some would say they'd hear cannon fire and hundreds and thousands of people would fall to the ground. There's documented accounts coming under conviction of the Holy Spirit. There were areas that caught fire in such revival they called them burned areas. Right before the Civil War, Jeremiah Lampier, a burden of prayer came on him in New York City. Some call it the Third Great Awakening. Prayer shook the North before the Civil War. It swept through the Civil War as the Confederate Army was defeated. The Spirit of God fell on many Confederate soldiers by the thousands. They were weeping and broken. Before World War II, a young man named William and Seymour, his parents had both been slaves. His dad had fought for the Union. Came out of Louisiana. God met him. Ended up in Los Angeles. They locked him out of the church because he talked about the second blessing. A family, an African-American family, invited him in on Bonnie Bray Street. Their great-grandson is in our church at Bethel. At a 10-day prayer meeting, the rest is history. For three and a half years, three times a day, the power of God filled a horse barn. And all the world was shaken in revival before the first and second great wars. After that, once again in the 1940s and 50s and 70s, God poured out his spirit. Charismatic renewal, 100 million Catholics alone were born again around the world. When it hit us in late 60s and early 70s in Southern California, if you haven't seen the movie Jesus Revolution, I recommend you do. That was in my backyard, 90 minutes from my house. It swept over my public high school in 1971. Kids just began to cry and get saved. It became common to be born again. When you're young, you don't realize you're in history. 200, 250 of us at lunch would weep and cry and worship. It was like what you felt here to the 10th power this morning descended in a secular high school at lunch. Many believe we're in a season like that right now. Why would we believe that? I'll take a moment because I want to get to the essence of what I want to say. But let me say this. Let me talk about some revelation from the Holy Spirit, then some concrete observation that lead me to believe we're in for an outpouring of the Spirit. You'll watch it sweep over the Horn of Africa. It'll sweep over Arethia. It'll sweep over parts of Yemen. It'll sweep over Ethiopia. You'll find it in the heartbroken Sudan. You'll watch the Spirit sweep over the islands of the Caribbean. You'll watch Eastern Europe awaken, and don't be afraid of the Ukraine war. We were speaking to our team in October of 2021 and telling them, don't be afraid, Russia's going to invade your country for a land grab, but the lion is greater than the bear. He'll slap their hand away. I sat in the February of the invasion in my office, and the Lord said, Monday, Russia's going to invade the Ukraine. Don't be afraid, Jim. And I love Russia. I've worked with 2,000 churches there. It'll be worse for them than Afghanistan in the end. I have a plan. Watch me awaken Eastern Europe. 
Here we stand. The Lord reigns over the earth, not the enemy. I'll never forget June 9th, 2022. I was crying out for our country, crying out for America. The next thing I knew, I had an impression of Jesus walking across America, crying, and he began to pray to his father one more time, one more time. I realized he was praying for God to revive us one more time, one more time, one more time. I said, Jesus. And the father said, one more time. And I saw the first huge raindrop drop from heaven. The Holy Spirit whispered, the first drops are falling. It's not business as usual, Jim. It's not business as usual. August 24th of that year, 2022, I was in Birmingham praying. I could see the first drops splashing in churches and people coming early and God moving. I said, what about the rest of the world? He said, I'm going to awaken the his, open the historic wells of revival around the world. The next thing I had an impression of the UK. No one knew the queen was sick. The whole nation was weeping, crying. The Union Jack was at half mast. People just broken. I thought, my gosh, what's died? My Jesus, my Savior, grabbed the lanyard of the flag and jerked it. It came screaming to the top. He said, I've not forgotten my promises to the UK. I'll restore my glory. A week later, the Lord said, when the Queen of England dies, you'll know revival's imminent. Here we are. It was February 3rd of this year. I was in front of my world map. A map covers my whole wall. My wife knows one of my favorite places to be. Praying over my map till late in the night. A big atlas to study. Putting my hand on countries. As I'm coming with a storm warning, thunderstorms of revival are coming to America. You're going from drops to a deluge. And by the way, thunderstorms come in the form of the pillar of a cloud as cumulus clouds are stacked. When you see Theophanes in the Old Testament, God's typically coming in a thunderstorm. Of course, it was the next week on Wednesday, I think the 8th, the Holy Spirit sat down on Asbury, a little town of 6,000 with a small college that became the center of the world for 17 days. A few students were playing after chapel. They'd all thought, including the speaker, it wasn't the best sermon. We have a church close to there, so we had every nation, we had people involved. The kids felt God. They began to text. They never left for 17 days. By the last day, there were 20,000 people on the campus, lines for hours and two and a half miles of cars. In a stark little auditorium, nowhere near as nice as this, God decided to stay a while. Here we are. If you wanted more of God in your home, in your church, on your campus, in your life, what might you do? How might you live? What's he looking for? You realize, to use the Lord's term to me, the world has come to an inflection point. It won't stay the same. It's either going to dramatically worsen or dramatically change. And without revival, the world's on a brutal course right now. America's future will not be decided by the 2024 election. Who are you voting for, Pastor Jim? Probably Reggie and Bomi this time. They're better than anyone running, for sure. And if you're real political, sorry to be offensive. But it doesn't take much sense to realize that's true. Politicians have never controlled the future of the world. I've been before the greatest leaders of nations. I prayed for some of the most powerful people in America. They're more scared than you are. The church, God has put the future of the world in the hands of the church. 
if we were to have more of God at Kings Park, what must we do? More in our homes, like. Those of you who know me know I like alliterations a great deal. I love things that rhyme as much. My wife always laughs. She said, you spend more time on things that rhyme and alliterations than you spend in your Bible when you're doing a sermon. Don't tell anybody that. First of all, will you heed what the Holy Spirit's saying? All across the world, the Holy Spirit is saying, get ready. I'm going to do something. Like, what should you heed? What's he asking for? Make no mistake about it, the world's scared. I remember the first time I really got involved in high-level politics. I'd sent some things to the White House and heard back. And I got a phone call from arguably the wife of the second most powerful man in the country. We begin to pray in tongues on the phone. She said, listen, my husband and the president don't know what to do. They're scared to death. We need God. I was young. I thought, well, God, I thought they knew what to do. That's why I elected him. I began to realize, no. We need God. You have the power to make a difference, and here's why. In August 22nd, I was sitting in Amarillo, Texas, Take me a long while to get there. I was with a great church in Amarillo. I was in the hotel getting ready to meet with their large staff the next morning. I would sat in the Dallas airport seven hours to get the next plane. Well, I didn't quite sat. I ate at one of my favorite restaurants, but that's another story. I know that's hard to tell looking at me. And the Lord said, Jim, a fresh sense of my presence is going to come to churches all over America. And each church's response will determine the duration and the depth of what I do. Will you become a cloud seeder? I said, okay, like I've heard of this cloud seeding deal. What is it? There'll be another slide magically appearing up here about cloud seeding. Cloud seeding really works. They use it in certain climates across America. There's two ways. You can drop seeds into the clouds or through ground-based cloud seeders or generators, there's heat that propels silver iodide into the clouds and it can get you 10 to 30% more rain. He said, Jim, I want my church to begin to seed the clouds in prayer. We know in the Old Testament it says, ask for the Lord, ask for rain in the time of the rain. He said, Jim, if my church will pray, if they'll cry out, is they feel more of my presence. Like I was sitting, how many of you felt unusual presence of God this morning? I'd been meeting with some people and got here a little. I sat down, I felt it. My wife sat next to me, we were going, come Lord. Same thing we've been doing every night for years, I might add. He hovered around a while. Paul and, you know, Paul and the team didn't even want to stop. Feel it. Let me, let me illustrate what I'm talking about. You look in Revelation 8, 1 through 5, you find an example of this. When they opened the seventh seal, you know, we'd seen monsters, demons, horses galloping around, all this stuff. There was silence in heaven, and I think God says, this is a bigger weapon than everything you've ever seen coming. There were angels standing before God getting ready to blow their horns. Another angel comes out with a golden censer. That, that, the incense of heaven, he mixed it with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar. Then he took fire from the altar and filled it, put it in the censer, and he threw it to the earth, and when it hit the atmosphere of the earth, there was thunder, rumblings, and flashes of lightning. A weather change was coming. 
When your prayers ascend to heaven, God ignites them with the fire of heaven and seeds the clouds of his presence. You say, I'm just human. Me too. So was Elijah, the Bible says, in James 5, 17 and 18. He had a nature just like ours. When he fervently prayed that it didn't rain, it stopped for three, and eight, three years and six months. He prayed again. Heaven gave rain, earth bore its fruit, and also the rains of a revival came. Your prayers are powerful. They're greater than the UN. They're greater than our polarized Congress. Don't kid yourself. When I feel a presence like that, I want to worship more, 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 more. Don't leave us. Don't leave us more. Why? Because you were created to live in the presence of God. Much of the neural pain we see today is life apart from Christ and life apart from presence. We're never made to function that way. You thinking you can live without the presence of God is like thinking your body can live without air. And when the God's presence comes like that, the church is revived and precious men and women who don't know Christ are touched and drawn. Will you heed and will you seed? Will you seed the clouds in prayer? I might add, will you feed? Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. That wasn't cannibalism. He defined it by saying, unless you do my Father's will and feed on his word. May I tell you, what does it mean to feed on God's word? Every time we approach God through these spiritual disciplines, prayer, worship, waiting on God, fellowship, all those things, we feed. It's like our connection with the Holy Spirit is further released and the life of the Godhead comes into us. But it doesn't just do that. When you worship, when you praise, whether you're at home or we're here together in the house of God, in reality, you are the temple of God. We're one big temple together. If this became a Walmart, God wouldn't be here in the same way. But God says this in Isaiah 60, 6, 1. Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you'll build for me? Where will my resting place be? What's he saying? Hey, where can I kick back? Where can I put my feet up? I've traveled the world. A lot of houses have been built for God. Very few are his home. What does it take to make God at home? What's he desire? How many of you know if you're at someone's house, you can tell when it's time for you to go? They don't have to say anything. You can feel it. God can do. If you're in a hurry to leave, God's in a hurry to go. He can tell when you want him to hang around. He can tell where he's welcome. He can feel it. There are intangibles, but what are the tangibles? Like, what is God looking for? He says in Psalms 132, 13, and 14, speaking of the great temple Solomon built, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He's desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here will I dwell. Well, I liked it there. What's God like? What's God long for? What makes him want to come to Kings Park? A lot of talent here. It's not that. There's a nice building. It's not that. Why does God rest in one place and not another? His presence is everywhere, we know that, but why is it manifested more greatly? Like, if you wanted more of God, what would you do in your home? Like, what's he looking for? Well, it's really clear from John chapter 4, when it asks, what's he looking for? It says this, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. He wants worshipers. You go, well, I'm a worshiper. I'm not talking just about Sunday. He's looking for women. He's looking for men. He's looking for young people who, first of all, have laid down their life and said, here I am, I want you. But they want to meet him in worship. They want to praise his name. They want to meet him in the spiritual disciplines. And worship draws God. Praise draws God. The blood of his son draws God. God looks down and says, is there somewhere I'm wanted? 
That woman, I love her. Elisha used to come. Prophets of the Old Testament represented God in a way we'd understand today. God would be with him. She told her husband, I'm sick of him coming to eat. Why, what would it take for him to move in here? She goes, honey, let's build a room for the prophet is God. It's all for them, favorite colors, favorite food. Sure enough, next time he came, he spent the night. The next was history. Why is it important? When the presence of God manifests, ideology can't resist it. Orientation can't resist it. I go to a lot of countries and one of my favorite, the, the Communist Party was taking over. The whole world was afraid. The whole country's shaking. I sent word to one of my friends who was highly influential. I said, tell the leaders of the Communist Party I want to meet them when I come. Much to my surprise, it happened. I showed up in the country and he said, well, Pastor, the leader of the Communist Party for this whole region of our country is coming to see you with some of his soldiers. I could hardly wait because I knew I had the one thing with me they had no weapon against. God's word and presence. I, wa I was in a room waiting with my friend who by blood is very highly respected in his nation and by character. They marched in. It was like a grade B movie. Fists and berets and fatigues and anger. And the boss was a portly man like myself. And I love portly men. Thank God for a few of us left. And, we, and, and, and he sat down in his whole cadre behind him. And the Holy Spirit came on me. I began to pray by the word of knowledge about his health. He began to weep and sob and cry out to Jesus. And his cadre goes, I'm next. Pray for me. Jesus, help me. His children came to hear me preach and his wife. They came to the church that Sunday. Before I left, I'd sent a word to the head of the Communist Party. Presence. When the presence of God comes down in our culture, darkness backs away. When the presence of God comes on your culture, it trumps ideology every time. People follow with their heart, with their heads hardly believe in, and their head catches up. That's what God is promising us here. Here. That's what he's promising us. That's what he has for us. Now, when that atmosphere comes and you're feeding, are you leading? Acts 1.8 says, when my spirit comes upon you, I'll make you my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. What happens? Well, when, number one, when the spirit comes on us, we're freshly empowered. Number two, when the spirit of God comes on the world, people are freshly open. You say, oh, I thought God does it well. The apostle Paul was blinded by a light. Jesus appeared to him and he sat in darkness three days till Ananias came. If there's ever been a moment to invite men and women to church, it's now. If there's ever been a moment to reach for your neighbors, it's now. And it's only going to get more clear. God's presence is going to land here in a whole new way. You'll see it. Yes. You will. It's already happening. This is your hour. And may I say, don't miss your deed. In the book of John 10, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. If there ever was a time to, to leave and really enjoy a dialogue with God, not a monologue, it's now, Christian. Are you tired of talking and never hearing back? He'll speak back to you. He'll talk with you. He's, you can feel his presence. There's a greater manifestation of his presence. He's around you. 
My goodness, he'll quicken scripture to your mind viscerally. He'll share his emotions and his peace with you. You'll hear his soft voice. You'll see impressions. It's now. Don't settle for a monologue. Have a dialogue. He's here. He's here. He's here. He's here. At 17, I didn't know what I was in. The Holy Spirit touched my Baptist parents. My dad was the deacon of his Baptist church. He said as long as he's a deacon there, that wouldn't mean that Holy Spirit stuff in the church. My mama went out and got baptized in the Spirit. He didn't quite know about it. He laid down one night. Holy Spirit shook him like a leaf all night long. He said, I went to bed a Baptist and I woke up with the Holy Ghost power. My mama said in that little neighborhood in the 1960s, the house would be packed with women from the neighborhood wanting to be filled with the Holy Spirit. She said, my one-year-old brother, the Holy Spirit would hit him. His little knees, he'd raise his hands and begin to jabber in praise to the Lord. You say, that's a baby. No, that's the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist praised the Lord in his mother's womb. You say, Pastor Jim, I want all of God I can get. Raise your hand. If your hands are up, stand to your feet. Great pastor, join me up here. I'm going to pray for you now. Normally, Kathy and I would be here to pray. We have another meeting. We're going to have to run, get ready, go. So you won't see me here, but we have plenty of people here to pray for you. Now listen. Raise your hands. Say, Holy Spirit, I want all I can have of you. I want to heed your word. I want to see the clouds of revival. I want to feed on you. I want to lead my precious friends and neighbors to you. My fellow students to you. I hold on to my deed. I want a dialogue. I want to hear you. Know you. Experience you. Now let me pray. Holy Spirit, we just want more of you. Holy Spirit, life without you is no life at all. Holy Spirit, come deep, come our all in all. Come in ways we've not seen you. Touch those who are lost, those who are small. We live in an hour we've never seen. Darkness is fleeing, your glory will beam. You're touching our families, our children never the same. You're healing our broken heart, taking away our pain. Flood our homes, flood our lives with your presence. Fill us till we don't want to go away. Shatter the darkness. Break the bondage that has held us. That has locked us down and kept us at bay. We just need more of you. We just need more of you. More of you, more of you. Deluge, we call you down. Drowned our fears and freshly wash us. Take away our dry eyes. Let them flood with tears. We just want more of you. More of you. More of you. I will answer you. From heaven I've heard your cry. 
I'll not leave you any longer high and dry. I'm opening the floodgates, starting with your heart. For it's through your prayers the deluge will start. I will flood your dry places. I will blow down demonic dams. No one can resist me, for I am the I am. It is the moment you've prayed for. I've heard all your cries. And now I'm stepping down from heaven. I'm coming from on high. You'll know weeks of my spirit lifted to another plane. You'll find my great arms stretched out, my eyes a burning flame. Driving back your darkness, you'll never be the same. This is the hour of my presence. Call now on my name. We call on your name. Let's call out to him. Drench us. Come, Holy Spirit. Drench us, fall fresh on us. Come down, Abba Father, Abba Father, Abba Father. Drench us. You say, ask for the rain in the time of the rain. Cry out, let him hear your voice. Cry out. The world depends on the cry of the church. Pastor Jim, we thank you, Lord, for Pastor Jim, Lord, for moving through him for the sake of your body. Lord, we pray blessing on he and Miss Kathy. Lord, we pray that you would bless them in this season of their life, oh God. Lord, that they would see, Lord, revival again, more than they've ever seen, mighty God of heaven. More than they've ever seen, mighty God of heaven. Lord, I pray for every one of their children. For their grandchildren, God, for their great grandchildren, Lord, that this family line would see and be touched by revival, oh God. Lord, I thank you for your work in and through them. And Lord, we receive this word in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 